16 or so, 17, uh, I was found to have atrial fluttering, which is similar to atrial, uh, to AFib, atrial fibrillation, um, which has badly affected my coordination. <laughs> Just kidding. It hasn't. I have no excuse for that. Just a klutz. But um, uh, and anyway, so um, which I've always been pretty healthy. Um, so this was a shocker, out, just out of the blue. I, I got a. I had a really bad cough in November, and I think that's what happened. Is I got a virus, and because uh, the doctors tell me I got a virus, uh, which caused fl fluid around my heart. Oh, thanks. <laughs> testing, testing. Is that better? Okay. So I got fluid around my heart. That caused my heart to have to work harder, and that caused the atrial fluttering. So um, if you ever notice you've got fluid around your heart, you might want to see a doctor. Just um, and uh, right away. And uh, so uh, then I had to wait around. Uh, I, we were down in Florida at the time. And I was planning to be going back and forth to, to work down there and work at home, you know, coming back and forth. But anyway, I had to stay down there. Finally, on January 29, I think, um, had um, ablation uh, procedure where they uh, uh, kill the bad parts of the heart. Anyway, something like that. And that seems to have worked great. The problem is, during the several weeks I was waiting, the heart was having to work extra hard, so the muscle being a, a uh, the heart being a muscle, it enlarged. So um, so now my heart might be a little weak, or uh, and it might be a permanent thing, and might not. We're we hoping and praying it won't be a permanent thing, and I uh, hopefully in in two weeks when I have my um, echocardiogram, hopefully that'll that'll say oh it's shrunk. So we'll see what the doctor says. So I appreciate your prayers and, and continued prayers because I'd love to not have to worry so much about how much salt I eat or, uh, that sort of, or, or I'd love to be able to go back to drinking coffee and to work exercising hard and that sort of thing. I'd love to be in a race with you someday, Jerry, and even though I'd, I'd never have a chance, but especially since you know, you're apparently getting younger. So uh, that'll never happen. Anyway, but that's that's what went on with that, and and still going on. So I appreciate your prayers. Uh, let's have a word of prayer before we get into the the lesson for the day. Dear Father, we thank you that we could be together today, and um, that we could fellowship with one another and worship you together. Remember your Son. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. Thank you for sending him to come and to die in our place, to suffer for us, to become sin on our behalf and uh, to pay the penalty that we so desperately needed to, to be paid that we couldn't take care of it ourselves. And so we thank you that he did and uh, that you give salvation through Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for the uh, wonderful reminder we had last week of the fact that he did not stay in the grave, but that he rose from the dead. And thank you that we, we serve a risen Savior and uh, we, we look forward to being with him and with you in a more direct way, uh, face to face. But in the meantime, Lord, help us to serve you well, uh, to spread the great good news of the gospel. And um, we ask you, Father, during our time together that we would uh, learn your word a little bit better. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> so. Amalia has put this up here, and um, how many of you like to do puzzles? The older I get, the more puzzles I like to do. Um, so this year, I, th this winter, I couldn't, you know, go out and do a lot of fishing and stuff. We were down in Florida, and I try to, I try to ride my bike a lot there and do occasional fishing. I had to really take it easy, but I could work on puzzles, so I did several puzzles. I I've always enjoyed puzzles. My mom loved, loved puzzles. Um, but uh, with, when you're doing puzzles, you need a few things. One, you need a light. Okay, that helps. 
Two, you need a table or something like that. Another thing that's really helpful is the picture of what you're doing. And yeah, you could do a puzzle without the picture of what you're trying to put together, but boy, it sure helps to be able to pick up the piece and say, oh, I see that there's a rose on here and there's a rose on the puzzle. This is where it goes. You know, it, it helps to get the picture. It doesn't, the, the picture of the puzzle doesn't show all the fine details of every piece, but it gives you the, the, the overall idea of it. So I was asked, and I've, I've hinted at this idea that the, you guys might enjoy the walk through the Old Testament that Joe and I uh, learned at Emmaus, you did, right? And Liz, I don't know if Luke, um, if Luke Menting had that, it, that's a little, he's a little more recent. So, but anyway, when I was at Emmaus, I learned this walk through the Old Testament. It's a bunch of, bunch of motions that take us through the Old Testament. It helps us to put the Old Testament together in one big story. So we're going to um, look at a few things here. First, first, the library of the Old Testament, 66 books. Um, interesting, Old Testament is spelled with, uh, Old Testament is not 66, the Bible is. Old Testament, the word old has how many letters in it? O-L-D, three. Uh, the word testament has how many letters in it? Nine letters, three times, wait, three, time, three and a nine, not three plus nine, but a three and a nine is 39. There's 39 uh, books in the Old Testament. So that might be one way to remember how many is in there. 39, three and nine, Old Testament. I'm sure that when people put, made the word old in the word testament, that was their plan. Uh, in the New Testament, N-E-W, New, and Testament, 9, 3 times 9 is 27, 27 books of the New Testament. Uh, so anyway, isn't that clever? So, but we're, we're, uh, we're just going to look at a few things here, uh, history, pro poetry, and prophecy, uh, his, where is that? There we go. Okay. And sorry, we've got this here. Just, we have a few slides that I don't even know why they put them in here, but we are looking at the beginnings. So this morning, we're going to start by going through the book of Genesis, of course, and then carry on a little bit. But we're going to be getting up and down. So if you're physically able, and I saw most of you standing, even walking during the break. So uh, you're probably phys physically able to stand up and do a few hand motions. Before we do, I always like to start with this. I do a little dance, I'm dancing in church. The reason is I look really silly, right? So now when we do these hand motions, you don't have to worry about feeling silly because I look sillier than you did. So even if you feel silly, you're at worst the second silliest person here today. So everybody stand up. We're going to warm up. Uh, Got to warm up our muscles before we uh, really learn this walk through the Old Testament. It's, we're, it's 40 hand motions that we're going to learn during my next three uh, messages. I know Jerry has the strength to stand because he can run. If you can run, you can stand. Can we run through the Testament? <laughs> So here we go. We're going to pretend we're back in Florida and we're going to the beach. And when you go to the beach, one of the fun things is a, to take is a big beach ball. So you reach your hands, see, big beach ball. You go to the beach, you take this beach ball and then you go into the water and I'm going to push this beach ball down. Ready? Push it down. You know, it's fun to push the, the beach ball down into the water, but pretty soon it shoots up and out. Okay. As you can imagine what happens there. Ready? Let's try it again. Ready from the top. I mean the bottom. Ready? Beach ball. Walk into the beach. In the water. Push it down. Up and out. Just like that. Let's do it one more time. Ready? Got to get warmed up. Beach ball. Down. Up and out. Okay. Excellent. Guess what? You've already learned the first four out of 40 hand motions. So go ahead and have a seat. We're going to talk through these a little bit. Um, I do want to think about the map. Uh, of the Old Testament. And so you see here, this is Babylon right here. And this is a country that um, later uh, uh, invaded and took 
people from Judah over to Babylon. And uh, we've got here the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River, the Dead Sea, <clears throat> excuse me, the Dead Sea, you see Egypt down here. Okay, so we're gonna think in terms of a map here and um, I have to think in reverse. Okay, so up, up, uh, I'm at north, okay? Babylon is over there, way to the west, right? Oh, excuse me, Babylon's over there. Yeah, but, uh, way to the west, there we go. And we've got the Sea of Galilee here. This parting is not the parting of the Red Sea, that's the Jordan River, okay? And then the Sea of Galilee, is uh, the, the Dead Sea rather, is way back there in the opening, and Egypt is off that way. And again, Babylon is over here. So you might keep that in mind and, and think about that. That might come, come, you know, come into play here and there. So, first book of the Bible, it's Genesis. There's a big N in the middle. Why would there be a big N in the middle of the word Genesis? Big N means. It's big, it's a book of big N means. Big beginnings, that's right. It's a book of beginnings. All sorts of things start in the book of, uh, of Genesis. You see creation beginning, you see mankind beginning, you see family life beginning, we see uh, something of the, the idea of government beginning, you see Israel, God's, God's chosen people, the uh, nation through whom the, the world would be blessed, through whom would come the Savior. So a whole lot of beginnings that come in the book of Genesis and thus Big N, so you can remember this if you ever want to know what the book of Genesis is about, beginnings. There, did you know there is a book of the Bible that is all about a baseball game where they scored a lot of runs in the eighth inning. They scored nine runs in the eighth inning. Anybody know what book of the Bible is about that? They scored, that was a, that was a big bunch of runs they scored. That was a that was a that was a big inning. <laughs> you don't like it, but you'll remember it. <laughs> beginnings, okay. Beginnings, okay. Here we go. So in Genesis, a little bit about Genesis, a uh, little bit about creation. Uh, and so let's uh, let's open our Bibles because we are looking at in the Word of God. We're going to try to understand the Old Testament a little bit better. And in Genesis chapter 1, there's a phrase that occurs quite, uh, that a few, uh, occurs several times. Uh, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God, God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning one day. Then God said, let let there be an expanse in the middle of the waters. Let it separate the waters uh, from the waters. God made the expanse and separated the waters which were be below uh, the expanse from the waters which are above, and it was so. God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening, and there was morning a second day. Let the waters below the heavens be gathered in one place. Let the dry land appear, and it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the gathering of the waters he called the seas, and God saw that it was good. It was good. And there's that, that uh, phrase is, re is repeated several times. Here we go. In verse 12, God saw that it was good. So over and over here, he keeps creating these things. Various things in creation, he keeps saying, it is good. But there was one thing that was not good even before the fall of mankind, and I'm not talking the devil or the fallen angels, any of that. There was something that was not good. Anybody remember what God said it was not good? And it leads to a second thing that was begun. Anybody remember what it was? That's right. It is not good for the man to be alone. And so he, God created Eve. And that doesn't mean every man has to have an Eve or that everybody needs to be married. But we are, 
although that's most common, but we are created for relationships, for meaningful relationships with people. And so some of us will remember that um, Simon and Garfunkel song. I am a rock, I am an island. Remember that one? And we're really not at our best when we're living as islands. Now, I speak to you as, as a somewhat introverted person. I, I, I spend a lot of time alone. I, I'm going to drive home alone. Um, but we, we need relationships with other people. And uh, anyway, so we see the, the beginning of mankind. It says in verse 26, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, let them rule over the flesh of the sea and over the birds of the sky, over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. You see that, that mankind has authority over the earth. Of course, God is ultimately in control and in authority. Um, that we see that we are created in the image of God. We don't see that uh, cats, especially not cats, are created in the image of, of God. We don't see that dogs are, or that fish are, or that deer are. None of the animals are created in the image of God. Only you and I are created in the image of God. And that's, that's actually pretty uh, practical to keep in mind in, in light of political things, that we are created in the image of God. But we are given responsibility of taking care of the earth and such. So, so he gave... Um, he uh, created us, and he created us, he created us male and female. There was not, there's not anything else, no other options. You know, in, in uh, Dubuque, at least one of the schools has a place with cat litter in the restrooms. It's, it's insa insanity out there, right? People thinking they can identify themselves. Well, God's given us along these lines only two options. You're male or female. You're human and you're male or you're female. And uh, we don't get to choose, which I think is part of, part of the devil's reasoning in bringing all that sort of uh, horrible stuff about is trying to turn people away from the ruling of God in, in our, uh, our hearts. But anyway, he, he gave, uh, he created us all. It says, it is not good for, in chapter two for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. So there's the beginning of marriage there. And everything is great. And Adam and Eve are getting along great. God did tell, uh, God did say in verse 17 of chapter two, uh, verse 16, he commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat from it you shall surely die. But that won't be a problem, because God gave Adam and Eve lots of trees to eat from, so I'm sure it won't be a problem, you know, what he says about that one particular tree. Will it? And yet it will, won't it? So on Instagram, some, one of those, Instagram or Facebook, I was reading uh, something lately, uh, recently, and they were talking about the sinfulness of mankind and something. And somebody said, um, I would have eaten from the tree too because I'm just as sinful as Adam and Eve were before they ate it. Something like that. But Adam and Eve were not sinful before she took that bite and gave it to him and he took the bite, that bite. They weren't sinful human beings. They weren't inherently sin. Sin came to us through the death, uh, through the sin of Adam. And uh, so until that event, they were, they were innocent. That, in fact, that's, that's why some theologians term the the time before the fall, a time of in innocence, a dispensation of innocence is how some have described that. But anyway, so we've got creation, and then we've got the fall. I told you that we, I've taught you the first four emotions uh, already, so there's creation. He's, he makes everything, and then fall. Mankind eats that forbidden fruit uh, in Genesis chapter 3, and uh, it says, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was delight to the eyes and the tree was 
desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. And so instantly, from this point, radical change in, really, in all of creation. The eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. Then they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? They tried to hide from the Lord. And so from, this, from the point of eating this forbidden fruit, mankind has always had a, a problem in their relationship with God. And we, because of our sin, are naturally separated from him. And thus we so desperately needed the Lamb of God to come and to take away our sins. But you see problems, mankind with one another, they tried to cover themselves up. They were ashamed. Uh, they ha instantly have problems with God. They try to run away from him. They even instantly have problems with the rest of creation. And you see uh, it, when um, God tells Adam, you're going you're gonna to have to uh, work hard for a living and it's going to be laborious and such part of the curse here. And with the woman, I will put enmity between you and the woman to the serpent. Uh, to the woman, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. Um, to, to the man, cursed is the ground because of you. And so cursed is the ground. Instead of um, being easy, just going and picking fruit from the trees, uh, now, it's, now you're going to have to really work hard. There's an interesting book that I've listened to portions of it. And it's called Eden, I think. And he, it's, it's, uh, it's, what would it, historical narrative uh, or historical fiction or something. It kind of acts out in, in the, uh, yeah, acts out what some of the things might have, have been and shows Adam and Eve just not getting along and she's bitter at him and he's angry at her and, He's having a horrible time trying to uh, trying to get enough food for him and for Eve, and and she's getting sick, and he's worried. How can I keep keep her alive, and and so on, and and so all sorts of troubles happen because of this, because of the fall of man. They were eventually evicted from the garden, and uh, and so on. But uh, what a what a radical change and a horrible change, and yet this all leads to uh, the Son of God coming and dying for us. So we have creation, fall, and then the next event is the flood. And uh, sin enters mankind, enters the world. Uh, people start doing awful things. Cain kills Abel, right? Cain kills Abel, uh, included. You, you must think Adam and Eve must have just felt incredible guilt that look what we did and as a result one of our sons killed our other son well eventually there gets to be more and more people and they become extremely guilty uh, extremely sinful so turning to genesis chapter 6 where you start reading about what would eventually be the flood god the lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the heart Excuse me. Every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The Lord was sorry that he had made a man on the earth and was grieved in his heart. Wow, that the Lord God himself was grieved. The one thing is this, um, this reminds us of the sinfulness of sin, that we shouldn't be taking it lightly, right? God doesn't. He was grieved in his heart at the sinfulness of mankind. So let us not grieve the Lord, and thus let us instead live godly and holiness, uh, holy lives and grow in godliness and holiness. And so he says, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things into the birds of the sky, but... 
Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. That's Genesis 6, verse 8. And so, of course, um, the Lord picked out Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives um, to continue the to continue humanity and kind of give it a, a almost a sense of a restart. Some have likened uh, the Lord Jesus to being the ark through whom humanity could be saved. That's, a, I think, a fair illustration to use. Um, anyway, but it, it was an enormous ark. So when I was a kid, I grew up near Seattle, and we had, in fact, still have this gas station chain, Arco. Some of you have seen Arco, I'll bet. So Arco is around, and Ark, right? And when I was, when I was a kid, they gave out Arcs, uh, Noah's Arcs that you could get at Arco, and these little wooden people, and it was a cute little boat about this long or so. It was plastic. It was one of those that was kind of narrow. It would have the V shape probably not very much what Noah's Ark was like. Um, I haven't been to the, the new Ark in, where, where is that, uh, outside of Cincinnati, um, but I, I think it's more of a flat bottom, I think they say, but it's a huge thing. If you read the dimensions in the Bible, it's something like 450 feet by 80 feet, roughly. That's one and a half football fields, not including the end zones. So, very long, uh, very wide, 80 feet, over 25 yards. Uh, and, and I think over, uh, about 45 feet tall. So uh, an enormous thing. Dr. Dave Reed uh, in his notes at Emmaus showed, showed how many um, train, what are those called? The th train cars? Yeah. Uh, that that would have fit inside, and it was I think it was hundreds uh, that would what is it? Boxcars. Box cars, thank you. That's it. Boxcar children. That's right. Box cars. How many of those would have felt fit uh, in in uh, Noah's Ark? And I I think it was hundreds. But anyway, it was a huge amount. Uh, some people say, well, you couldn't have gotten all those animals on the ark. Well, uh, they, they, Noah and his family probably didn't put full sized adult elephants on there, right? They probably put baby elephants, right? Probably didn't put, how much is a, a full-size cow weigh, Dave? Uh, 2,000. 2,000? Uh, 13 to 2,000. 1,300 to 2,000. Probably not a full-size one. They, they probably put in calves. Just made sure one was a male and one was a female. And they did, they put in babies or little ones. Um, they didn't put every single kind of dog that you see out there. You know, they, dachshunds and um, cockapoos and, and cocker spaniel and poodles and black labs and yellow labs and golden retrievers. He didn't do all that. He had one dog and one male dog and one female dog, whether they were wolves or coyotes or whatever it is. But anyway, it wasn't as much as some people might think, but it was one of, one male and one fe female of every uh, every kind of animal, and uh, so it was a huge undertaking over a hundred years that uh, they were building this. If you ever feel like, um, um, you know, in preaching or teaching the Bible or spreading the gospel, you're frustrated that people don't get saved. How many uh, converts did Noah have? <laughs> None in over a hundred years. So don't feel too bad. Um, sometimes I go to Coronas. I think almost every year somebody. Some kid has professed new faith in Christ, but, but I think there have been a year or two, and it's like, oh, rats, but okay. Anyway, uh, God's in, in control of such things. We just stay faithful, and Noah and his family certain were, certainly, worth, oh, certainly were faithful. At the end of their time, the, you know, God uses the, the rainbow, so keep the rainbow in mind, promising that, that the Lord will not flood the entire earth again. So we got creation, fall, flood. And, and then um, Noah's family, uh, they reproduce. God says, uh, multiply and cover all the earth. And they did a good job of multiplying, but not of covering all the earth so well. 
because there's a place called Babel, a, a tower that they started building, and uh, that was in Ge uh, Genesis 10 and 11 that they, they were building this tower and saying, you know, we're going we're gonna to go up to God. Anybody here speak any foreign languages? Sprechen Sie Deutsch? Verstehen Sie Deutsch? Ah, better than mine. Ich spreche sehr bisschen Deutsch. Und je parle très un peu français. Très un peu. Anybody speak Spanish? Yes, at least Roger does. <laughs> uh, any other languages we speak? How about English? Anybody? We, so we all speak different languages. Uh, uh, what if what if we were here and we had you know twenty different languages we were trying to speak? Wouldn't that be a mess? Well, that's what eventually God God uh, caused to happen. When I was in college, uh, I was at a community college, and and um, everybody was to write a paper on how we got all these different languages. And the idea was not that we turned to the Bible, but I did anyway. And I wrote it. I think I got a good grade, A or B on it. I forget, but good enough. And uh, I, I said, well, at least early forms of the languages would have started at the Tower of Babel. And uh, surprisingly, my teacher didn't downgrade me for it. And so, yeah, it probably wasn't German. It probably wasn't Spanish. Maybe it was Latin, maybe it was an earlier version of Latin, but <clears throat> a bunch of diff <clears throat> excuse me, a bunch of different languages that uh, came up there. And you can imagine they're building this tower, and one guy uh, yells out, you know, does, they don't know what's happened, but all of a sudden God confuses their language, and he yells out, "Hey, buddy, uh, hand me the hammer." But to that other guy, "Hand me the hammer" means hit me in the head with that thing you've got. And so he reaches over and he hits him in the head. Anyway, it would be a, a kind of disastrous, but you, you, it must have been a scene where people were shouting in their languages, hey, and, and eventually you hear somebody over there who's saying this, the same stuff, speaking in a language you understand. So you go over to him and uh, then you hear a gal over there who's, who's uh, talking in a way you understand, so you go over to her, and pretty soon there's a bunch of people who speak Latin all together. And then a bunch of people discover and they're, they're speaking some form of Aramaic or whatever, and they, they go and they go to this part of the world, and they go to that part of the world, and so God uses that to spread around the world. He said, go uh, multiply and spread around the world. That's how God caused that to happen. So let's do these four motions. We got creation, fall, flood, and nations. God caused the nations to spread out. So let's stand up and uh, practice our motions. Ready? Creation, fall, flood, nations. Now say it with me because uh, um, uh, you know it'll it'll help cement it in your mind if you say it with me. Ready? Creation, fall, flood, nations. Excellent. Now I'm not going to say it. You say it. Um, ready? Go. Creation, fall, flood, nations. Excellent. Now uh, find a, a friend or two and practice with them. I'm going to try to find my water. Okay, very good, very good. Joe, do you remember what's next? 4,000 years ago. Oh, yeah. We see. Now we're getting into a different version than what Joe learned. It's even nations we did like. Oh, you did that. Okay, very good. Yeah, that's actually a good way. People spreading out. That's, yeah. Creation, fall, flood, nations. So I went to uh, this group um, uh, to learn these things, but yeah, the, but uh, the version we're learning is only 40 motions, and I think it was like 80 or something that we learned. In yeah, in the original, yeah. So, um, oh, we're still in the book of Genesis, aren't we? 
So people, and these uh, nations were formed, they spread all around. And uh, finally, uh, in, let's turn to Genesis chapter 12. God's God says it's time to, for, for us to start this very special nation, what we call Israel. And there is uh, a certain man that he calls out. The Lord said to Abram, and so Abram and his wife Sarai, later their names will be changed to Abraham and Sarah. Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So he says, Abraham, I want you to go. And uh, Abraham went. And God, uh, Abraham was a great example of faith. And I've probably told you this one one time I was listening on the radio I was driving around and listening to some preacher and he was talking about uh, Abraham's faith and it was demonstrated here and it was demonstrated in offering Isaac and elsewhere that Abraham was a man who believed God and even the book of Romans points to him as a great example of faith he believed God and God reckoned it to him as righteousness and so um, God, uh, oh, and so I was listening to this sermon, and I'm like, yeah, I can't wait to preach this someday, because people need to hear, they need to trust God, and then I realized, oh, I've been dealing with this, which at the time was the sale of a, a house we used to have, dealing with this uh, sale of our house, and I've been nervous, and upset, and uptight, and probably difficult to live with, and um so now I'm going to trust you, Lord, and I'm putting that house in your hands. And I kind of hoped, sort of, that the Lord would not see fit to sell the house because I really wanted to learn to trust him more. But actually, it wasn't long after that that the Lord did see fit to sell the house, and I'm, I was grateful for that too. <laughs> anyway, uh, so Abraham was a great example of, of that, and but sometimes he didn't trust the Lord. He didn't always... Uh, you know, sometimes he had his moments. So let's turn to Genesis 15. Genesis 15. He had his moments of, uh, is this really going to happen? Um, uh, we see the covenant with Abraham here stated. And it says, and he took him outside and said, now look towards the heavens and count the stars if you are able to count them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. How many of you enjoy going out at night and looking at the stars? Isn't that, isn't that a, just the, the greatest thing? Now, I, in my neighborhood, we don't have street lights, which is a negative, but it's a positive if you want to go out and look at the stars. And I don't do it very often, but every once in a while, I'll, I'll take a few minutes or even pull out a lawn chair and just gaze at the stars. It's a beautiful thing. So... Here's uh, Abraham, and God is reminding him or presenting this covenant that he is, he is making with Abraham. And he says, this is how great you're going to be. This is how many descendants you're going to be. Go outside and look at the stars. And if you could count them, you'd be able to count your descendants. You're not going to be able to do that, Abraham. But... Um, Look at the stars, and it reminds you that you will have many, many descendants. So for the, the motion for Abraham is stars. We say Abraham, okay? So Abraham. And then his first star, well, first he, he has one son, but not by Sarah. So he was not the, the promised one, was not the next patriarch. The next patriarch, we're going to grab one of those stars and bring it down and rock the star rock a by isaac right and so we're going to say isaac okay this is going to help us to remember who abraham's son is it is isaac grabbing the star and rocking it so we say we say abraham and isaac and he was the second patriarch of israel and the third one was jacob jacob yes and um, 
Jacob didn't get along very well with Esau, didn't get very long, along very well with his father-in-law. You might say he, it's almost like he wrestled them and he, rest, and he did wrestle the Lord eventually uh, later in his life. And so we're gonna use this motion like arm wrestling. And we say Jacob, because Jacob wrestled. He wrestled with his brother, he wrestled with his father-in-law, he wrestled with God. And so we say, Jacob, be careful, by the way, about arm wrestling. I have a nephew, strong nephew. He, he posted this on Instagram, I think, where he, was, he had an arm wrestling match with some big, strong, tough guy. You might be thinking where I'm going with this. Because if you think of the motion here, that is a dangerous motion, and that's what happened. His, he broke his arm. <sighs> oh. Had to have a pin put in, and anyway, so be careful, don't, don't arm wrestle. Uh, <laughs> I, anytime I think about arm wrestling, I just think about what, what happened to my nephew. So anyway, but, but think about Jacob, uh, and we say Jacob, and because he was, uh, he wrestled with God, but, but um, um, he eventually came to be a, a one who, who believed in the Lord and, and uh, a, a good man. But he had a bunch of sons, right? A bunch of sons. His sons all got along beautifully, didn't they? No, they didn't get along so beautifully. Uh, he had a favorite, and his name was Joseph. Okay. So Joseph uh, wore the, was given the coat of many colors, right? And some say that that was given to him because of uh, Jacob saw him as being the next leader of, of the family. I don't know that for sure, but anyway, it sure marked him as being special. That didn't help Joseph's relationship with his brothers, did it? But anyway, we've got, Abraham, throwing the stars, Isaac, rocking the star, Jacob, and then Joseph, the snazzy dresser, the coat of many colors. Joseph is probably among the favorite characters in the Bible for a bunch of us, right? He's one of my favorites for sure. What a great example of uh, faithfulness to the Lord, of, of patience, of looking back at the sovereignty of God and trusting the sovereignty of God, right? So his brothers, just to review, they're jealous of him. He comes, they're out in the field. He co uh, comes and from a long ways away, they start developing a plan. Let's throw him in the pit. So they throw him in the pit, but then, but then they say, uh, no, actually let's sell him. And they sell him into slavery. And so he gets taken uh, far away into Potiphar's house and um, does well in Potiphar's household. He um, serves Potiphar well and uh, becomes uh, really high in authority within Potiphar, Potiphar's household. And that's great reward for serving faithfully and having a good attitude until Potiphar's wife comes along and she you know, notices him and tries to make a pass at him. It doesn't work. He runs away finally and um, uh, but she grabs his towel or whatever, and, um, and she accuses him of rape. I have to think that Potiphar really didn't believe her because you'd think he probably would have just had Joseph killed. But anyway, he throws Joseph in prison. After a couple of years there in prison, or at least he's, he's uh, finally, he's let out. So you have to think while Joseph is in prison, he must have been miserable and upset and thinking, God, what are you doing? Have you ever prayed any prayer like that? I sure have. What are you doing? Can't you, can't you help me out? That's a, I've tried, I tried to serve you faithfully. Lord, can't you help me? Yeah, I do that sort of <laughs> thing. And I'm probably not alone in that. And, um, and yet sometimes the Lord sees fit for us to go through certain hardships. And that was very much the plan for Joseph and, and the Lord working in Joseph and, and him going to Egypt. It might have seemed ridiculous. How can it make sense for me to be away from my family, to be in this country far away? Well, you know the story. 
eventually there's a drought and this leads um, Joseph's family to need corn that Joseph has been made second co in command over all of Egypt and uh, his family needs corn and Joseph is able to do it and he, uh, the whole family comes back, comes down to Egypt. And so because of Joseph being in Egypt, the family of 70 or so is saved. And in fact, that in, in Genesis chapter 50, Genesis chapter 50, so they come back, they come to Egypt, and Joseph, the snazzy dresser, has taken care of his family. Long story short, of course. And, um, but uh, Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, uh, he has died, and the brothers are like, uh-oh, okay, dad is gone, now we're in trouble. Now Joseph is going to take revenge. Isn't that pretty reasonable thinking? I mean, at least natural thinking. Joseph can't just let this go by as if nothing happened. We're, we're in deep trouble. And so his brothers came and fell down before him in Genesis 50, verse 18, and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in God's place? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. You meant evil against me. What the brothers did, there's no denying, it was evil. It was horrible. It was hideous. And they meant the evil. They, they meant to harm him. There was no, it wasn't like it was an accident. They were trying to do awful stuff. But God meant it for good. And the good in this case is to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive, to preserve this special nation that God had, this special nation, Israel. And if you read later in the Bible and later in history, outside the Bible, you see times in which Israel's um, future or existence seems to be in doubt, right? When in uh, the book of Esther, the uh, uh, Mordecai has led the king to um, make these pronouncements that it looks like it could mean the end of, of uh, God's people, God's chosen people. But God works sovereignly and put Esther in this special place so that the people of, uh, so that uh, the people of Judah could be saved. And uh, when Assyria attacked Israel and scattered them, dis destroyed the, the nation and scattered them, and we don't know really where the northern kingdom is now, but they're, they're still alive. God's in control. And then Babylon comes to defeat Judah, and, and it looks terrible. And guess what? Terrible stuff happened. And it might seem like, oh, no, you know, God's people, they're going to be completely gone. But God preserved them. There was an article by Dr. Dave Reed, who taught at Emmaus Bible College, called Foiled Again. And he talks through these different times in the Bible and actually elsewhere, uh, other times where Satan was trying to destroy this, this nation through whom would come the Savior, the Lord Jesus. And um, he, his attempts were foiled again. And in this case, he brings the people um, the, this chosen nation into Egypt and gives them a spot that's kind of away from um, a lot of the people of Egypt where they could grow and become a nation of two or three million um, over 480 years or so. And, um, and also where they could keep their unique identity. Some have said, well, if they had stayed in the promised land, they would have had a great tendency to join the other, uh, other people groups and le uh, lose their identity. So God brought them, 
because they were a holy nation, he set them apart. That's what holy means. He set them apart in Egypt to grow, to become a, a large and great nation there. Anyway, God meant it for good. I have some friends who um, their son, as a teenager, was killed in a hunting accident. And on his tombstone, on his gravestone, they had uh, God meant it for good. I think it was on the grave. Somewhere I saw they, where it, it was meant, uh, it was read, written, God meant it for good. And um, not that the hunting accident was an evil thing, but God meant it for good and brings about good. We had, um, when I was in Atlantic, we had a kid in our youth group who died in a car crash heading to school. Great kid, believer, he's with the Lord, um, but hit some ice and um, died instantly. But God meant it for good. And at least one person got saved through the funeral and all that, that took place and all of that. God meant it for good. Okay, so we have uh, Abraham, we have Isaac, rocking Isaac, we have Jacob, and we have Joseph. So let's stand up and do those four together. Well, we got through Genesis. We've got a long ways to get through the, uh, the rest of the Old Testament. Not that we're doing that today, but anyway. So uh, we, have, we have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. Do it again. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. Ready? You, we'll, we'll do it together and you say it. Ready? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, One more time. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Excellent. Let's do the whole thing now. Ready? Here we go. Can you remember eight things? Creation, fall, flood, nations, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. Excellent. Now find a friend to, to, do, to do these with just for a moment. You two need a friend, don't you? Okay, have a seat. Have a seat, please. Okay, we'll do uh, just two more motions. This is a bad place to stop at two motions, but we're going to do it anyway. Uh, who do you think is the next person? Any guesses? Moses, right, like this. Linda, is this the same one you learned? Yeah, this is what we're teaching. This is what you're teaching. And, uh, and I don't feel quite exactly like you do. Okay, but the same, same stuff motion. and yeah, same basically motion. the same motions. Yeah. Okay, we're cool. Up to solid and no <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. So anybody other than Linda? Uh, do they really? <laughs> Great. <laughs> Great. Okay, who, well, just don't think in terms of motions, think about the biblical characters. After Abraham, who do you think is the next great Bible character? Right, Moses. So Moses. So they're in Egypt, and uh, at first everything's good, but then the uh, another pharaoh comes along, and he becomes concerned about the, the, this group. And, uh, and so uh, he enslaves them, and for 400 years they were enslaved. And finally, God says to, to Moses, I, I want you to lead them out of Egypt. And he has a certain tool that you see quite a bit that he carries around. Anybody remember what that tool is? Staff. The staff. And so we go, Moses, like this, like he's holding the staff. And it's, it's good to try to, ladies, you can do, a, do your best you can, but try to use a low voice. Moses like that and trying to be macho because he was I, I envision him as being a fairly macho guy 
Moses. After all, he was 80 um, at the start of his time when, when he started leading them uh, and uh, you know, kept going for 40 more years. So he was, uh, he was, uh, he was something else. But we say Moses, he used the, the staff um, with uh, some of the, the uh, dealing with some of the plagues and all um, and, and miracles accordingly. But um, yeah, but, but Moses and Pharaoh keep going back and forth. He tells Pharaoh, let my people go. And, and Pharaoh said, no. <laughs> Do you remember the motion? Oh, um, it was the, the old version was something like Moses, uh, let my people go, no. And so, so Moses would say anyway. But Moses said, "Let my people go." And he said, and Moses and Pharaoh kept saying, "No." Actually, sometimes he would say yes and then take it back, and yes and take it back. And and uh, so Pharaoh was kind of, uh, kind of a, a mess there. And finally, the tenth plague is the most awful one, and it's the the death of the firstborn. So, what do you think? God makes a way for his people. And of course, the answer there is yes. And, he, and so we have the Passover. So we have Moses and this great, in Exodus chapter 12, if you want to read that later, but we're about out of time, is the great um, um, feast, the, the Passover. And they were to take the blood of the lamb and put it around the doorpost, and that's why we go like this, Passover, and, um, and thus the, the firstborn would be preserved. People were saved through the blood of the Lamb. It's a beautiful thing um, in Exodus chapter 12. But we'll, we'll stop there, but I would just urge you to, to keep working on these, try to uh, have these memorized as well as you can. Uh, maybe I, I always like to point out at least one lesson to go home with and just to remember the one of the key lessons from the life of of Joseph you meant evil against me but God meant it for good and maybe it's evil that someone has done to us or maybe a, 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 a hardship a tragedy something you know bad or disappointing and, or difficult that has happened you know this this heart of mine uh, the troubles there Sometimes I've been really frustrated about it. Every once in a while, I think good thoughts like, <laughs> like God's in control. Uh, anyway, knowing that he's in control does help us and gives us some peace as we go through whatever the hardship is, whether it's the death of a loved one or illness or financial or job hardships, but we all go through different ones at, at different times. So with that, let's close in prayer. Dear Father, we thank you for this fact that you are in control. Uh, sometimes things happen that we don't like, but we know that you love us and you are all wise and you're all powerful and nothing happens apart from your sovereign will. And it, uh, even, even evil things you allow. And the life of Joseph, people did some terrible stuff to him. And yet, um, yet you're in control of it all. And bad stuff happens to to all of us and yet you're in control and we thank you for that please remind us of the lesson of joseph here of trusting you uh, of staying faithful to you even uh, as we are as we go through different hardships in life thank you for your uh, your word including the whole old testament help us to remember some of the things we've thought about and uh, to understand the big picture of how your your word fits together in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What? Uh, box cars to the heart. Oh, okay. Thank you. I thought it was several hundred. Okay. 520. Yeah. I'm going to write that. What's that? Matt and I, we used to go basketball oh did you i've i've been to the museum but never but not since the ark was built did you 500
dummies or whatever they call them. Building That's not very nice. They, they, do, they probably don't appreciate you saying that. <laughs> do, do they? Oh, oh yeah. Uh, do they really have robots doing it? Do they really have robots doing it? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 